everyone. Can you hear me okay? Um, welcome to the Center for Research on Vermont's Research in Progress series. This is actually the last one of the semester, and I'm very glad to see you all here. Um, I'm Margaret Tamulonis. I work over at the Fleming Museum, and I'm the board chair for the Center for Re Research on Vermont. And um, actually, this is my chance to really thank Richard Watts for his really hard work at the center as the director and his work on this series, as well as the annual meeting that's coming up on May 7th. And that's my plug for that. You can check our website for more information. I'm very happy to introduce the speaker. Um, Christopher Jones received his doctorate in health economics from Oxford University, where he was a British overseas scholar. He is an assistant professor and health economist in the Department of Surgery at the University of Vermont's College of Medicine, as well as director of the Global Health Economics Unit in the Center for Clinical and Translational Science at the College of Medicine. He is also working at the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. He is the author of many interesting publications, and his research has been focusing on point of care cost analysis and the personalizing of patient care to be both efficient and effective. Please welcome Dr. Jones. Thank you, Richard. That, uh, that, of course, is all true. Uh, an excellent obituary for me. But uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to talk about, uh, in this very casual setting, uh, focusing on Vermont, uh, some of the research that we're doing. And uh, if anyone wants to chime in at any time, we'll have some time uh, after this for questions. But feel free to interrupt if there's something you know, really pressing on your mind. Improving health outcomes and reducing costs. Um, I'm going to start. Here's the overview. Uh, very brief story of kind of my evolution uh, to Vermont. The intricate balance between biology, behavior, and economics, that has always been a, a stumbling block for me because uh, that's kind of the evolution of my career, and yet I was unable to explain it until very recently, so this was a helpful opportunity to do so. Uh, I'm going to introduce the field of health economics. Have any of you or all of you heard of health economics? What's the read of the room? Okay, so more on this side, including my wife, so that doesn't count, and, uh, <laughs> although it should. And, uh, and then some of you over here hopefully will take something away in regards to how health economics allows us to see ways in which to, we can improve, or by which we can improve outcomes and reduce costs. And I hope that by the end of this, you'll also take away that patients are extremely complex. Um, and heterogeneous, what does that mean? It means diverse. Uh, we're diverse creatures, and I think medicine uh, needs to uh, evolve a little bit to encompass that more fully. Uh, and the focus really is going to be on opportunities, ultimately, that can start here in the state of Vermont. So a little bit about my evolution. Uh, I actually grew up in New Hampshire. Um, my, my grandmother was born uh, just on the Vermont side of the river. Uh, and. Uh, she said, you can always tell a Vermonter, but you can't tell them much. <laughs> so, I don't think that's actually true, and I hope by the end of this talk it will certainly be a myth dispelled. Um, and now you're thinking, don't blame this speaker, but blame Richard who invited me. <laughs> um, but humor is a very important uh, way in which we can communicate, and I think that's also a point that I want to touch on, uh, because I'm going to talk about Twitter and all sorts of fun things. Um, so three examples. Uh, uh, nothing more than that. Uh, one example is going to be in the space of uh, aneurysm repair. Uh, so the artery that supplies blood to your, to your gut and to your heart um, can expand and present huge problems. It can rupture. Uh, so that's uh, kind of a life-threatening condition that I'm going to talk about. Uh, fertility treatments, um, uh, specifically in vitro fertilization, um, and that's reproduction without sex. Um, and then finally, i um, going to talk about incentives that drive healthier behavior, okay? And mobile incentives in particular. So we're really in kind of encompassing the technology that exists here in Vermont in ways that can make us healthier, which is, I think, a very Vermont approach to this. So I got my start, as mentioned, uh, at the University of Michigan, actually, as an undergrad studying biology. Uh, I was excited about genes and then parlayed that into understanding the currency of money. Um, and went over to England to study biology a little bit more, and then ultimately economics, and saw that ratios are very important. Uh, if you read the blurb uh, here, Euclid came up with ratios a long, long, long time ago um, in, in the third century BC or fourth century BC, but um, 
ways that, by which we can improve outcomes per unit of health, sorry, imp, reduce costs per unit of health benefit. So improve outcomes or reduce costs. That's a kind of a golden ratio uh, of our times. Uh, Algo Bay mentioned in a, in a uh, presentation, he's the head of the Green Mountain Care Board, that uh, the uh, spending currently on healthcare exceeds 20% of our GDP. That's an enormous sum when you consider that all of the Army and military, uh, uh, Navy and Air Force combined are attributable to 5% of our spending. All auto imports, including all auto manufacturing, including imports, something like 4%. So it's a really big deal and we have to curb the cost. But how do we do that? Um, well, you don't do it necessarily by the way my career um, uh, 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 started. Um, I worked for the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, uh, which evaluated this type of scenario. Um, the drug companies obviously wanted to maximize their profits, uh, shareholder profits, uh, and get a return on their investment. And so drugs and devices became very expensive. Uh, we asked those companies to tell us what, uh, what is the return on the investment. So as a payer, the United Kingdom at that time would, uh, would cover, uh, make a coverage decision, so the NHS would have to pay for a drug, uh, but only if it showed uh, that it improved the quality of life at a reasonable cost. Okay, I then ended up working for a drug company very recently uh, and got to see kind of the other side, which was also very helpful because an enormous amount of money is required uh, to bring a drug to market, which is another broken area of our system. But I'm not going to talk about that. But the point that uh, I wanted to make was that all of these things add up, and it's not just the drugs, it's not just the devices, um, but it's the system itself. Uh, it has a lot of fat in it, and that's why we have the highest spending per GDP uh, uh, when we benchmark ourselves to uh, every other uh, first world country. And so, where does economics fit into this equation? Um, not only do I want a cracker, we all want a cracker. Well, we have unlimited wants, needs, and aspirations, and yet we have finite resources. So in the Garden of Eden, we didn't have to worry about this, but unfortunately, since then, uh, we have to make choices. So economics, if you take nothing else away from this talk, economics is about choice uh, given scarce resources. It's not about ringing in the cash register. That's a, a myth that I'd like to dispel right now about health economists. Um, we're not accountants. Uh, we want to understand more what's the relationship between this scenario and this scenario, which of course is another myth around how doctors handle situations. Uh, no, wait a second, that's accurate. <laughs> um, they often have to handle the situations downstream as a last resort, and when one problem is solved, another soon enters the equation, and so palliative care until the point of uh, our expiration. Okay, so health economic economists want to look at uh, that northeast quadrant, which essentially is uh, cost on the y-axis and effectiveness on the x-axis. And most new innovations that uh, improve our lives or maintain our lives cost money to do so. And so you'll see that most things end up in the northeast quadrant of that diagram. Some things uh, convey a benefit and they're actually uh, no more expensive or even less, in which case they'd be in the bottom right, but you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot and pay for something that is less effective, pay more for something that's less effective, and you tend not to want to go with a, a cheaper, less effective option. So most things tend to be uh, on the right side of that diagram in terms of comparators. Does that make sense? And for those of you who are really savvy with ratios and slopes and so on, the slope of that line uh, is actually the maximum acceptable incremental cost effectiveness ratio. But we're not gonna talk about that either. I wanna keep this fun. Uh, this is from a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Chris Danforth. This, these are Twitter feeds. Uh, specifically, these are Twitter feeds around the time of the Boston bombing. Uh, this is the anniversary of that, so I think it's very timely to mention it. And so whereas this has traditionally been my field, okay, this one diagram could sum up, you don't have to take my course, just look at this diagram, but uh, no, you'll learn something in the course too. But this is where I want to see health, econo health economists applying what we know to situations like this, because there's meaning here to the words people use, and we feel that there may be clinical meaning. Uh, an example would be mining the Twitter feeds like Eric is, in the audience is going to do. 
um, around uh, pregnancy and smoking. What do people feel about that? Uh, are there revealed preferences? Are there revealed states of affairs? Do uh, people feel more comfortable talking in a Twitter environment, in a low stakes environment, uh, rather than in a high stakes environment, uh, for example, in the hospital where uh, folks can feel intimidation? So yeah, I just think that this is an excellent uh, way of quantifying. Um, they say talk is cheap, but I think uh, this really quantifies the value of chitter chatter and, and talking. And uh, just to kind of highlight on one area, you see that that was a very low point in terms of the Mechanical Turk evaluated words on the top right hand side of that um, as compared with uh, other, uh, in fact, all across all of those other months. Uh, so I think this is a, is a really valuable form of communication. It also has geo coordinates that we'd like to look, uh, look at further. So, we aim to, in collaboration with Peter Dodds and Chris Danforth, um, mine the Twitter feeds for clinically meaningful and health economic uh, related information, which is a nice segue to this very simple equation um, that computers can assist us in a way that our brains alone might not be able to fully appreciate. And this is a tough equation to get across to the clinical world, but it's absolutely true. And when push comes to shove, uh, many uh, uh, clinicians, particularly the young ones, are now uh, turning to the uh, cyberspace in order to uh, inculcate them with uh, uh, either a validation of their clinical impression or some meaningful statistics or even perhaps you know, some benchmarks against what other people are doing so that they know and have the comfort that they're doing the right thing uh, at the right cost. So efficiency is starting to enter the picture, but it's not entirely there yet. Um, this is uh, an equation that I've been struggling with, which is, again, a nice segue to kind of bring up, uh, welcome, Lawrence, which is a, a, a nice way to kind of bring up, uh, you know, the evolution of, of my career, which has been starting in biology, going on to understand behavior, and then seeing that the interaction between those two uh, can lead to those choices that I, in a scarce, uh, given scarce resources. And uh, I think this is really uh, interesting because from a research angle, uh, all of these interact. And in the research space, one does not operate without the other. You can't have biology research without money. You can't have behavioral research without funding. And you can't study economics without understanding the biology and the way in which it interacts on the behavior. So some emerging insights, just to take a small pause. Um, Patients, as I mentioned, are highly heterogeneous, highly diverse, and clinical pathways we contend can be optimized to our individual circumstances. So the vision really is you going into the doctor's office and having something that's a path that's personalized to your unique needs. Um, and we feel that we may be able to leverage, we may be able to leverage some of the Vermont data uh, to, to tailor treatments uh, to the right people at the right time. And using what we called and published on uh, point of care uh, cost algorithms. I'll talk about those in a moment. Giving you a first example, uh, aneurysm repair. And again, uh, so we're talking about blood supply that's very, very important and uh, a vessel that uh, is unable uh, because of the lack of elastin to contain the blood and so it expands and can rupture. We're talking about uh, the patients coming into the clinic without, uh, before it ruptures and uh, facing some choices. Um, the choices here are to undergo an endovascular approach, okay, using a very costly device, um, or having open heart surgery, which is highly invasive and requires a long recovery time. So are all of you familiar with uh, heart surgery, or at least with how difficult it must be uh, for patients facing this? Okay, so we looked at direct costs, and we found that the red stuff, the red stuff, over here shows that patients who underwent endovascular aneurysm repair left the hospital sooner, but it cost more money because, again, the devices are very expensive. But that didn't happen across the board. There are some outliers, and I think those are very important because that's where you can actually find some real savings. Um, in the case of the open heart surgery patients, you see some of them leaving the hospital early, but by and large, they stayed you know, uh, 8, 10, 12 days uh, post-surgery. And on average, the cost was uh, uh, $10,000 less than in the corresponding endovascular aneurysm repair patients. 
Why is this important? Because it's an example where in, in both cases, no patients died. So we have virtual equipoise between the two arms. We can actually test where can we trim the fat? Where can we save money? Let's go back to this for a second. Um, these are just uh, some further distributions of the costs, highlighting that uh, the, in the space of uh, endovascular aneurysm repair, the costs tended to be uh, significantly higher than in the open space, but it wasn't entirely obvious, and that's uh, the subject of this slide. Um, and if you can just look across the top line, uh, open patients, patients who experience open heart surgery, um, amounted to a total of 115. Well, of those 115, 17 were predicted to experience lower costs if they were offered endovascular aneurysm repair. We found the same thing in the case of open, the vice versa. So there are ways that we can become more efficient. That's my point one. Any questions on that so far? How many data points is that? Uh, so the total sample was 158. Mm -hmm. These are small numbers. Uh, this is the subject of uh, an NIH proposal uh, that will allow us to test this prospectively. And those are Vermont patients? These are all Vermont patients. Mm -hmm. uh, so the data came from the uh, Northern New England Aneurysm uh, Registry uh, to which uh, a number of institutions locally uh, subscribe and uh, provide data, including uh, Yale, Maine, Dartmouth, and, and Fletcher Allen. Yes. Do you, do you have any data on the outcomes from the two different patient groups? Did they both do equally well? Uh, so, to very good question. I don't. I, I only know that they all survived, and, I, and it's too soon to tell whether uh, some will come back for uh, rehospitalizations. Uh, it's likely that those who under, underwent uh, endovascular aneurysm repair would be more likely to come back requiring open heart surgery. So, in that circumstance, it would just intensify our findings. Uh, the other uh, point I wanted to switch to now was, uh, I told you three examples, that's it. Uh, the second one was uh, fertility treatments. Are any of you or all of you familiar with fertility treatments, in vitro fertilization, it's kind of uh, test tube babies and so on? Okay, um, well you are now, but when I first started this, um, probably only a couple people in the room would have heard of it. Uh, so there's been a steady increase in couples using IVF worldwide. Uh, apparently over two million babies have been born uh, following assisted conception, uh, actually following specifically IVF. And this is because women are postponing their childbearing years by and large, but also because of other circumstances. Um, this technology presents a huge financial and emotional burden to patients. It's, uh, it often leads to twins in 25% of the circumstances. We published in the New England Journal on that very fact. And uh, uh, it's very important to provide appropriate counseling to patients. So we created this tool to be able to provide uh, a highly personalized care pathway, if you will, for the individual patient or couple experiencing fertility treatments. I won't dwell on the numbers, uh, but basically if you can save one cycle of treatment across uh, a couple million patients, that's a lot of money saved. Um, to whom is it saved? Well, if we take the societal perspective, society would otherwise pay for these babies who would end up in the neonatal intensive care unit. So what we're trying to do is being very proactive and provide appropriate treatments for the right patients. And to do that, we really need to look at single embryo transfers. Uh, so I got access to all the government data on IVF in the UK. Uh, this was a while ago, but it, the uh, findings are still very uh, prescient. And we were able to look at the chance of live birth, the chance of multiple birth, the cost, and what happens if a woman delays her cycle by, uh, delays her treatment uh, by one year, five years, et cetera. So we created this sliding calculator. And uh, we had a bunch of variables uh, included in this, okay? These are all found to be predictive um, of outcomes and of costs. The most important predictor here was the number of embryos transferred. And what we found was that if you build the house too high, it topples. Uh, if you put back a second embryo, you get a substantial increase in the live birth rate. Also, you get a substantial increase in the multiple birth rate, but it's usually twins. If you put back a third embryo, you don't get that same increase in the live birth rate and you get twins and triplets. So For My Odds uh, started as the first web-based tool uh, to counsel patients through IVF. And here's where we are today. Why did I present this? Uh, I really want to talk about where we're going. This is ongoing research, folks. This is not kind of stuff that I've done because I, I'd rather forget about IVF, quite frankly. Um, it, it's, so, uh, it's so demanding in terms of the, its complexity. 
Uh, but it's becoming very important here in Vermont. We have one purveyor, that's Fletcher Allen, of IVF. It's all privately uh, paid for. And so uh, the money is very important to patients, as, as of course are the outcomes. So we created, uh, uh, with my colleague Renju Raj, um, uh, an, uh, an Android app to actually um, uh, use Vermont data to get at the very heart of what are the various items that are predictive of outcomes and costs and for whom. And these include basic histories, medical histories, you know, are you a smoker, are you not, what is your age, your lifestyle, how many embryos do you expect to transfer, how many have you transferred previously, all these fun uh, things. And this is illustrated on, on, on slides like this. Um, but this, again, is, is an active app. Um, so we uh, intend to, to make this available uh, through Fletcher Allen or the College of Medicine or however it, it works. We put in an application for a small grant to take it forward. Um, Full disclosure, this is a company that I created. Um, it's also a company that I've uh, unfortunately paid more than earned. So I feel comfortable saying that it's really a voluntary initiative, although that could change. Um, and the chances of having a baby, what are the outputs? Well here, as I mentioned before, when you see uh, one embryo on the first bar, two embryos on the second, and three embryos on the third, this is for a patient <clears throat> whose age may or may not be shown above. But you see kind of very granularly 5.63% chance of taking home a baby <coughs> if one embryo is transferred. And, it, and the, grammar, the grammar is so new on here that I'm, I apologize, it has to be corrected. Um, and similarly, what are the chances of multiple births? That's becoming increasingly important. Uh, twin strollers at Shaw's are commonplace, and uh, I would surmise that triplet strollers are probably uh, in existence in certain wealthy areas like New York and San Francisco, probably coming to Vermont soon. Um, so what happens if I, as a patient, delay the start of my next cycle? Well, then you have these various eventualities. Okay, are you following me on this? Yep. And uh, what happens if I decide to wait five years? Well, you see a steep decline in fecundability. Uh, unfortunately, that the bottom graph is not tied to that. Uh, but in many circumstances, this is probably a young woman for whom five years is not uh, as dramatic, so I wish I had a different uh, example, but um, there is a steep decline in fecundability with time and with age, and uh, uh, that's an important uh, aspect that can be brought into the decision-making process at the point of care in the fertility unit. So our future directions with this mobile app that uh, True to Vermont, uh, Renju and his wife developed this uh, on their kitchen table. I provided a computer and uh, you know, we've kind of put this together uh, uh, over the course of a couple of weeks. We want to expand its compatibility with uh, mobile operating systems. Uh, we want to customize the data, as I mentioned, to make it much more uh, relevant to uh, Vermont, so using Fletcher Allen's data. Uh, we want to use this in, ex in assisting patients with counseling, uh, using their own individualized numbers, and then actually test prospectively whether this actually improves outcomes and reduces costs. Does it also make patients more comfortable? A big factor is the uh, hypothalamic uh, pituitary ovarian axis. So our, be our emotions are very important um, in, in undergoing fertility uh, treatments. So does it help with that? Uh, we'd like to test it. We want to design studies based on uh, uh, expected IVF outcomes and see whether the multiple birth rates uh, are reduced and whether we can actually stem the contentious uh, 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 aspect of fertility treatments, which is storage of unnecessary embryos. So we want to use this app-based data collection uh, to understand the treatment experience, and we feel that we can do that by tying this to mobile phones, and I'll talk about another example uh, in just a moment. So for this, I want to acknowledge, uh, again, the team that I work with at For My Odds, uh, Renju, his wife, Guri, uh, Louis Keith, uh, Professor Emeritus, and uh, Peter Casson. So that, any questions on fertility treatments? I'm happy to, uh, to take those after if you have anything further on that. Unfortunately, I feel pretty well uh, informed in that, in, in that area, uh, and we have a two-year-old. Um, so trust. Uh, this is a working title for something that I'm really passionate about, which is using incentives to drive healthy behavior change. So everything I talked about earlier involves behavior but this would actually incentivize patients to change their behavior. Luca Fernandez, uh, he, you know, he's uh, somebody 
that I would equate to Thomas Willis in times past. Thomas Willis was uh, a pathologist who uh, was the first to understand uh, neurology and put dye into uh, our veins and arteries and understood where things went. Uh, he employed somebody named Christopher Wren at the time, an architect, to uh, do his illustrations. But Luca's doing this for me. Ted James, uh, also a mega brain, uh, who runs the uh, simulation lab. And, uh, and, and we put this together. So again, using very, very simple slides here, uh, the idea is this. Uh, a patient is given a mobile phone or has one, okay? Um, they're a smoker, and uh, it, it, for one example, or have some other uh, 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 issue that uh, can be incentivized against. So for example, it could be uh, weight gain, or it could be opiate misuse, uh, something that's very uh, uh, prescient in Vermont. But let's start with smoking because I think that's the most preventable, the lung cancer that ensues is the most preventable human disease. Uh, and a patient will get a timed text Okay, you now have two minutes within which to blow into this. And if you blow into this and it shows that you have not smoked within four hours, you see a tangible incentive on your phone. You can redeem it for Amazon points or you can, you can uh, spend it uh, on healthy food or something that's good for you. That's an important uh, component of this paradigm. And there's some ID proof, whether it's fingerprinting or facial recognition. Um, and I've committed all of your names to memory with my uh, Google contacts. So, <laughs> Uh, something along these lines. But you can imagine this being applied, as I mentioned, to weight, blood pressure, blood sugar, lung capacity, uh, other sorts of things, steps, Fitbits. Um, so it's, it's tying that interface together. And Sassine uh, Pazim smartphone. <laughs> How you ask the questions obviously are important. Um, but the client could also uh, self-report. The user of this, the user experience, could also capture important emotive processes in the home environment. Again, why is this important? It costs a lot of money to do this type of research. We've got, uh, uh, Professor Higgins has $35 million committed uh, to uh, getting pregnant women to stop smoking primarily, and uh, it requires an infrastructure. And it gives people jobs, which is great to understand how to improve healthier uh, living. Um, but uh, you, it's, it's not scalable to the point of reaching millions and millions of users in the same way that we feel uh, enabling these mobile devices uh, with quid pro quos that say, if you uh, uh, meet these uh, uh, clinical checkpoints, uh, you will get a, an incentive that's highly, again, tailored to your individual circumstances. So the patient or uh, user receives a reward uh, for passing, taking the test, or other uh, measured health outcomes. And uh, this uh, uh, is highly uh, concordant with uh, a Higgins and al. Uh, 2010 addiction study, which showed that not all carrots are alike. When you tie a carrot to uh, showing up for an appointment, you get some measurable outcome. But when you actually tie a carrot to a clinically measurable outcome, you get so much more. And this has been demonstrated in the case of uh, babies born to, to smoking mothers who ended up in the neonatal intensive care unit. And uh, there was nearly a threefold difference in terms of uh, uh, patients entering the NICU uh, uh, for, uh, between uh, mothers who were given the uh, incentive tied to uh, uh, a measurable clinical outcome versus those who were given the exact same amount of money just to show up to the clinic. Does that make sense? So it exposes something of the human condition, which I find very interesting. Uh, we live in the here and now. We discount the future heavily. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, as you can imagine. Uh, the conditions under which we evolved were harsh, uh, <laughs> uh, worse than Vermont winters. And um, you know, it, we really had to think about finding a meal and, and avoiding becoming one. And so that's why we really want things here and now. And it's hard to delay. But we find that incentives can actually short circuit that process. And when I was working at the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence in London, uh, it was just wonderful to cite all of the papers that came out of Vermont on this very topic. <laughs> Um, and I'm not going to dwell on this diagram, but uh, this basically sums up uh, what Luca uh, put together in terms of uh, workflow. Um, we're building models that will build upon themselves. This is going to be a dynamic approach to creating optimal incentives that work. And if they don't work, they, they'll be stopped or another incentive will be adapted to be offered to work. And this one's tied to months engaged in an incentives-based program. One of the challenges uh, uh, we're learning is that 
uh, incentives work over the short term, but they're not sustainable necessarily in the long term. And so they have to be spiced up, they have to change, the goals have to be changed. You know, we're, we're creatures of habit, but we also want to have fun and we want to understand, you know, what's the next target. So we're hoping that this will be one step in that direction. And this one's based on number of tests completed. You know, what is the iterative uh, frequency that we should be giving these types of tests? Is it every five minutes? That would be annoying. Is it, is it uh, once a day? Perhaps not enough. So we feel in a mobile environment, we can tweak that pretty, uh, uh, pretty well. Okay, <clears throat> so made in Vermont. I've given you a couple of things that have been made in Vermont. Um, I think one of the key differentiating factors here is that we do things differently. Um, there is a, an incentivizing healthy behavior theme uh, with our diet, with our environment, with our uh, way of uh, offering clinical care. Um, I want to see more of making incentives fun and engaging, and I think that's how we can link ourselves to the Twitter feeds, to these mobile uh, 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 gamifications of incentives. Um, I want to see ourselves improving efficiency of clinical pathways, so not just creating clinical pathways um, that sit on a desk or in the uh, cyberspace, but actually pathways that make sense, that engage the patient to take a locus or better locus of responsibility over their own health, and that will lead to improved adherence, we contend, and improved compliance. Uh, those are very important components because scripts are often not fulfilled. Uh, patients, even once they have their medicines, don't necessarily take them. So we're working potentially with uh, providers of these devices that will actually uh, be able to inform us as to whether a patient has taken their medicine, whether they've taken their, uh, their methadone, for example, you know, in a maintenance capacity, um, whether they've fallen um, uh, one step down the uh, downward spiral of dependency and despair. We hope to be able to then cur curtail them so they stay out of the criminal justice uh, system and stay out of uh, the dependency world and measuring and maintaining quality of life, actually capturing that information so that we can really get a snapshot as to what's important to the patient. And of course, the um, all important buzzword of reducing 30-day readmissions rates. Why is that important? Because that's how hospitals are going to be benchmarked. And that's uh, uh, very important because that's how they get paid. If too many patients beyond a certain threshold come back within 30 days after they've been discharged from the hospital, then there are significant hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines in, 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 uh, in some instances, and that's something that we hope we can make a dent in. So what are our next steps? Um, we'd actually like to partner with Vermont reward uh, providers. You know, believe it or not, uh, there are um, uh, experiences, vacations, um, uh, tangible products, teddy bears and maple syrup and these sorts of things uh, uh, can really distinguish ourselves as offering something that's unique to Vermont uh, to, uh, to keep people you know, on the right healthy path. And we want to foster a win-win culture between healthy behavioral change, uh, trust, uh, apropos this platform, and innovation. And I think we you know, have the opportunity here in Vermont to think and to find ways that um, you know, in a safe environment, in a low stakes environment, um, that will, you know, lead to measurable change. So the vision, uh, this is Burlington, um, would be, you know, generating these types of algorithms, creating uh, applications, really creating an ecosystem, collaboratory, uh, uh, fostering this interdisciplinarity around uh, people coming together and talking and creating ideas, creating commercially viable opportunities, uh, because that actually can fund research. Um, and uh, where we are to date is, you know, I, I, I believe we'll have five algorithms by the end of this year at least. Uh, maybe we'll have 20 uh, next year, and maybe we'll have much more in 2016. So I've got a long list of acknowledgments, but let me just kind of start from the bottom, and, uh, and the rest of you can read. But the Department of Surgery, uh, the Center for Clinical and Translational Science, the Vermont Center on Health Behavior, uh, and uh, my Global Health Economics Unit. So thank you all for your time. I really appreciate this opportunity. It's certainly exciting. One of the things I'd like to conclude with is not just measuring how to change, but also measuring how to just stay healthy. So maintained and sustained healthy living is going to be another key component that we can uh, observe here in Vermont. That's the topic of another presentation. Thank you. to that. I love this. You can zoom out. This is a presentation called Prezi. And I can go 
this way, and shoo. <laughs> I'll ask a question, but did I understand it that you said that so the, the pregnant women who are smokers, in the example you were giving us? Yes. So they have an incentive to not smoke, to provide some funding or something. And then the way you're verifying that is that within two minutes of getting the call. Yes. Yes. So there are a number of devices. We've done some initial market research, something called the electronic nose, but there are like, you know, maybe 10 or 20 of these types of devices. So we'll partner with those uh, related purveyors of, of uh, devices uh, that are linked electronically so that we are able to kind of capture whether a task has been completed, a clinically meaningful task has been completed. And then you're saying maybe beyond that, there might be fun things, fun incentives for yes. us to maintain healthy Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are competitions that have already uh, others have created uh, companies that have created uh, um, a uh, gaming platform to lose weight. Uh, but the the important thing there is that you want to make sure that you have the right crowd. You don't want people uh, uh, fasting, you know, too much, uh, and you you want to offer healthy alternatives. So I'd like to create. You know, Google has uh, focused on advertising. Um, everything that you do on Google is tailored towards. Um, getting you in, in front of advertising and getting advertising in front of you that you will ultimately act upon. I'd like to offer healthier options, and we think that you know, maybe this mobile platform would be one step in that direction, connecting the healthy options to the, uh, 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 to the clinically meaningful tasks that people complete. Yes? You mentioned how, like, um, with the incentives that you would need to kind of spice them up and keep changing them to keep people interested, and I'm, you must have said it, but what were some of the, the ways that you would go about doing I think that? this is so new that I don't know the answer to that. That's what I, uh, I'd like to work with my colleagues on uh, in order to, you know, under, understand more fully what are the different options uh, and what are the changes between, between, let's call them carrots, but between prizes. You know, do you go from a prize to a lottery, a lottery to a prize? Uh, does that have to increase over time? Uh, there have been some studies in this direction, but that's certainly a hot area. And, uh, uh, you know, we have a, a fairly homogenous population here in Vermont, so let's take ourselves, you know, the opportunity to do some quality research on what works. So you mentioned lottery. I mean, right. it's interesting that people do tend to discount future costs way beyond a reasonable discount rate but they also still buy lottery tickets. In your incentive pool, are there particular incentives that you've seen that, that work particularly well mm -hmm. in this context? Yes. Or not? Well, uh, Professor Higgins is the, is the uh, godfather of this space. And uh, his team have found that the incentive needs to be very tangible initially. So he gives cash, $50 bills, $20 bills, $10, but whatever it is, cash, that's meaningful. Uh, skeptics will say, well, they can go out and buy more cigarettes or more heroin or whatever. Well, it's still a step in the right direction. What if they only do that 20% of the time? You've still made a massive 80% uh, difference. So you've got to take a long game on this, a long uh, uh, vision on offering incentives that drive healthier change. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of lotteries, uh, uh, Kevin Volpe over at UPenn has come up with a number of uh, things that work. Apparently, if you actually provide disincentives and take money away from people, that creates a better change, but you've got to know your audience. Um, and there are also things called Dutch lotteries, where you have to have the street buy in and do things, like mow their lawn or whatever it is to, um, to get into a pool. And if one person doesn't do it, then the whole street is not eligible for a prize. So you get a little bit of peer pressure, and you can play on that, the right peer pressure. So uh, the delicate balance of, of, of vice, things that are bad for us, tend to um, uh, start with uh, affi affiliations and exclusions. And if we can kind of take those affiliations and exclusions and say, you know, say, look, it's cool to earn money and do healthy things, then we're changing the game. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any concern with um, app-based data collection and app-driven incentives that uh, a percentage of the population will be excluded due to uh, socioeconomic limitations? Mm -hmm. And if so, what, if anything, can be done about that? It's a very good question. I don't know is a short answer to that. But uh, what we're finding also in our, in our initial research is that uh, phones are becoming more and more ubiquitous, and there's actually almost like a, uh, an inverse correlation between the computing power of a phone uh, and socioeconomic status. So 
uh, people who have uh, uh, e who have uh, insecurity in, in other very important areas often have the ability to receive text messages or even uh, phone uh, 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 applications. Mm -hmm. well, the provision of the phone could be part of the incentive structure. It could be, and, and I would hope that that would not be traded on the open market for something. So it would have to be something that unfortunately is not as cool, or <laughs> you know, there's a delicate balance there. But for sure, it would make sense to give everybody who's um, uh, uh, who's on the downward spiral towards overweight, um, uh, high calorie, uh, high sugar, uh, become pre-diabetic conditions, smoking, and drugs misuse, a telephone. That's a no-brainer. And you know, to the extent that they have, would have to you know, uh, uh, get in touch with uh, other people who could uh, shepherd them, steward them uh, towards healthier behavioral change, that would also be you know, something that, uh, that the payers of that phone or the payers of the consequences of those patients' misactions would ultimately benefit from. So you know, in order to uh, actually realize some uh, cost reductions on the other end, it doesn't take much. Well, it's great to see uh, a number of my students and, uh, and uh, fellow uh, colleagues and friends and uh, just thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to the Vermont Society and uh, hope that uh, you know, this inspires you to uh, come up with uh, you know, new innovations perhaps in this space. So thank you.